Welcome back to Kentucky Route Zero. So we're continuing our replay of Act 4, choosing the other options. We just left the gas station. Now we've arrived at the Rome Colony. So before, um, Shannon and the others went to the Rome Colony. This time, I'm going to choose Shannon retreated to the TV room to browse the Mammoth's video collection. Aw, Blue's over there eating food. And there's a kitty cat. So yeah, I think... I think this is when there was uh, some sort of a recipe show on the TV, right? I remember we were over here with uh, Will and Ezra making mushrooms too. I don't know if this is before or after. But it's around the same time, I think. Let's switch out the tapes. Shelves are full of dusty tapes. Some have been relabeled several times. The stickers piling up thick on their spines. Birds. Blue black morning swings across the screen. The bird watcher tramps through dewy grass. He stops with a wet grunt and rests the camera on a pile of rocks. Birds from Great Distances, episode 12, appears briefly on screen. He twists the lens by hand, pushing the frame past trees onto the road and coming to a halt, zoomed in on a fuzzy fist-sized artifact resting on the momentary stroke of a telephone wire. Shannon and the bird watcher observe. He breathes heavily, and she holds her breath, like she's afraid he might hear, afraid of distracting him or of being discovered and contaminating his perfect isolation. Traffic picks up, indifferent. As the sky lightens, the black smudge in the center of the fame frame gradually becomes more prominent, but never in any greater detail. Not bad, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> There's more birds. <laughs> I hope I can watch all of these. Question marks, funeral thing, weather. Two question marks. That awful hum. It seems to start before Shannon even hits play. Then there's the familiar room. There are the blank gray walls marked with tape and school desks. And this time she notices a few more details. The murky carpet like standing water. Some video equipment stashed in the corner. A row of lockers. And there's Weaver looking serenely at the camera. As before, she starts speaking, and as before, there's no sound but that hum. Shannon finds Weaver's words coming back to her as they appear in captions on the screen. Oh, this is really cool and important. I can't wait to see what this says. So this is the message we heard about that um, was being beamed to the, the TV station. I forgot the exact name of the TV station. But yeah, remember Weaver used to work at the TV station and then just suddenly disappeared, and then suddenly their broadcasts were being interrupted by this, the strange hum, and captions on the screen warning them about the flood, and these videos appeared for years before the flood finally happened. So let's see what they say. Male, school, and these magnificent tragic horses. 
Go underground as deep as you can go. The air is cool and the earth is damp. And when you close your eyes, you're surrounded by the dead. Remember where that is? You'll find your way from there. Go underground as deep as you can go. I mean, we are underground, right? When you close your eyes, you are surrounded by the dead. Is this talking about the mine? Must be talking about the mine. I think this place is what you're looking for. Some of it will wash away soon, but I think you'll be happy here, even without the mail, school. The text repeats for a few minutes and Shen and stops the tape. Huh. So yeah, I take from that that Weaver was telling Shannon to <clears throat> to go to the mine. Because didn't Weaver... Didn't Shannon mention that Weaver wanted her to come to the mine? I'm definitely going to watch every single one. Let's look at funeral thing. An elderly couple sit on folding chairs in the middle of a TV studio, undecorated except for a funeral lily in a thin blue vase on the table. The lights are a bit too dim to make out their features. She reads from a newspaper with unhurried efficiency. Gloria B. of Munfordville passed away on Monday at her residence. Survivors include her children, Dakota, Montana, Minnesota, and Bobby, all of Munfordville. A memorial service will be held at 7 p.m. Thursday at Hatton Huffman Funeral Home in Munfordville with cremation to follow. I I'm sorry, the children's names are Dakota, Montana, Minnesota, all names of states, and then Bobby. <laughs> Just Bobby. She never knew Gloria. He thinks he may have heard the name. Wondering aloud if she ever worked at a cafe down there in Munfordville. Mun Munfordville, excuse me. The woman who ran that place was once called Gloria, or maybe still is. They take a call. Someone who knew Gloria B, if if not very well. The caller once installed a satellite dish at Gloria's house. A 900 square foot ranch style home on two acres at a dead end, backed by weeds and pine. When the caller mounted the ladder up to Gloria's roof, she slid open her window and tugged urgently at his pant leg. He followed her gaze behind the house to two wild turkeys picking through the weeds. Gloria and the caller watched, silent and still, as the huge birds foraged obliviously into the trees. Then he installed the satellite dish. Let's do weather. The on-screen title identifies this program as The History of Weather, Volume 3, Drought. Over footage of a dry riverbed, the program's narrator explains the differences between modern drought and ancient drought. The narrator proposes that modern drought may hardly be considered weather at all, since its severity and behavior are so influenced by human activity. Boring, as it said. Science. I love those little details in this game, like the little interactive icon to get up is sometimes uh, a thought of Shannon's. 
like what they thought about the video. It looks like Will, though much younger, reclined on a sofa and taking calls. His arm, draped over the back of the couch, holds a bottle of something clear. People call in with stories of their encounters with the supernatural. Will offers little commentary or response. He acknowledges them. Sometimes he interrupts to clarify or repeat something back to them. Mostly he just listens and pulls from that clear glass bottle. A handmade banner strung above the couch reads, I believe you. Will? Question mark. Art thing. At first, she thinks the video might be paused, but on closer inspection, she can see the edges of the frame shrinking inwards around the chairs, desk, and loose gray furniture of a sterile waiting room. She watches for a while. She's not sure for how long. Several minutes. The zoom tightens. So gradually she sometimes forgets it's happening at all. And finally rests on an oscillating desk fan. She ejects the tape before the next part of the triptych begins. I don't know if that's actually pronounced triptych. Okay. <laughs> Shopping. How many tapes are there? I'm going to look at every single one, even if it takes me five hours. The woman sits at a card table with a lamp, notepad, and a beige multi-line telephone. A scrolling marquee reads, swap, shop, buy, sell, trade, or want to buy, call the broker. And then a phone number, repeating without pause. Eddie has fresh eggs to trade for a basil plant. A dozen eggs for one plant, which is a steal. Eddie's eggs are good eggs. Sadie has a bag of fine shells. No reasonable offer will be refused. Christopher is looking for a scrub plane in decent shape. It doesn't have to be too nice, just something to get a tabletop. A tabletop near the near too flat from some oak that's been air drying in a barn for 20 maybe 30 years and while it's true he could get the job done without it since he's got a nice heavy jack plane his grandfather used to use he just assumed not fuss with granny a, a camber onto it and anyway he has a little extra capital from a swap earlier in the week and wouldn't mind putting it down on a decent scrub plane before the cash burns a hole through his pocket Carla's looking to trade typing services for calligraphy services or vice versa the broker takes notes and switches lines, but never speaks, drunk on the hum of commerce. More birds. It's raining heavily as the title Birds from Great Distances Episode 27 flashes on screen. She knows by the sound, the volley of rainwater on mud, tree branches, the rusted bed of an old pickup, and on the bird watcher's own skin and hair. He swears under his breath. She can hear the rain there too, in his wet breath and the wet exclamation of his palm, slopping the water from his forehead and shoulders. Cameras pointed at a cedar shed with one hinged door angling erratically in the storm. From this distance, it's hard to tell if it's been damaged or simply left open. When the door swings wide, you can see that the shed is full of small boards, scraps maybe, or rough cut pieces meant for very small projects, and then stacked carelessly on shelves, in piles, quickly sorted and then forgotten. And there's the bird, a blue ball taking shelter on the shed floor, nested in scrap wood.
Little blue ball. I love tiny fluffy birds that are just balls of fur. Birds? Again? There's more birds? It's a lot of birds. The video is black. Shannon only knows it's playing because of the cicadas. And then, Birds from Great Distances, episode 81. The screen isn't totally dark, of course. It's what she thinks of as video black. The deep mottled blue, noisy with magnetic decay and the cottony limits of the camera sensors. It's the black she sees before she goes to sleep. The night black. The eyes shut against the street lights black. She has more words for it than she expected. She wonders what words the bird watcher uses for it. She wonders where he is relative to the camera, or where the bird is for that matter. Trivia thing. The words tip of your tongue and a phone number are occasionally superimposed on the screen. A few dozen people sit in bleachers, shouting out ideas, loosely moderated by a short woman with a microphone and laser pointer. One caller is trying to remember the name of an old friend she hasn't seen in years. It starts with a consonant. It's full of consonants, actually. There may be one or two vowels. It sounds long, but she doesn't remember having had any trouble spelling it at any point. The friend had brown hair? That's probably not helpful. Another caller is trying to remember a verb that means to make oneself vulnerable. Something like to expose oneself, but not quite that. To become emotionally, spiritually vulnerable, like with a lover or a poem. A third caller just knows there was something he was supposed to do tonight. He offers some biographical background, a narrative of his day, he's unemployed, has no real hobbies, and has already eaten few ideas from the bleachers. Lordy. <laughs> that sounds like a terrible show, my god. Looks like that's it. Wait, can I go back here? can't pet the animals. What's this? Oh, the light. To Will. No, no, it was only a few notes. Slow and sad. Like funeral music, you know? I don't remember being sad, just simple and unburdened. Maybe that's what funeral music sounds like to me. Unburdened. To Shannon? Oh, hello. Kate and I were just trying to remember the mammoth song. But neither of us have heard it for years. Will just found the mechanism. In the mammoth's belly. Hidden in gritty, matted fur. <laughs> it's like a big music box, a slowly spinning cylinder covered in metal pins that pluck her dulcet guts and pump the bellows in her bowels. Ew. But some of the pins are rusted and worn away. Easy to replace, if we can ever remember what the notes were. Did I hear you browsing the archive next door? Find anything good? Found something pretty unsettling, actually. Oh dear. I don't even know what's on half of those tapes anymore. They used to be all the movies. They used to all be movies and that kind of stuff. I like nature documentaries especially. Some people left home movies or little art videos they'd made. 
But that damned VCR devours anything you leave it in. It just switches into record mode at random, I think, and picks up whatever's coming in over the antenna. Of course, the only station we get down here is that WEVP. Community television, you know. They've got that show with a gentleman playing banjo in his birthday suit. I'm sure you've seen it. <laughs> I've heard of it. So yeah, that was the name of the place, WEVP. Wevip. Oh yes. And if there's no tape in the machine when it tries to start recording, it makes this awful sound. Like putting a squeaky toy in a food processor. I can hear it above deck. Awful. That's why I put that sign up. Please do not rewind after watching. At least that way nothing gets taped over anymore. To Will. You were in one of the videos. I believe you, it said. Where was that taped? To Will. You had a TV show? I never knew. Um, no, I don't believe I ever have. The title sounds familiar, but more like it's something I heard about, like secondhand information. They let anybody on there. That's the whole idea. Community television, or public access, they call it. I would say it's possible that I did the show you saw and then forgot. Wouldn't be the first time. Studio. Uh, no, I can't say that I remember where WEVP is, sorry. You should meet the shield. He did a lot of volunteer work for WEVP in the early days. Wiring up antennas and relays, stuff like that. I think you two would have a lot to talk about. He works at the telephone exchange. No, I'm afraid he's been let go. Oh yeah? That's odd. He still takes the ferry to work every day. I'm sure he's at the telephone exchange right now, in fact. I dropped him there a few hours ago. We're stopping at the telephone exchange again shortly to deliver their mail and pick up their trash. You should go ashore when we do. Ask for DeShiel. Here's the next option. So before I chose Valkyrie and Blue lounged below deck, which lasted for all of like five seconds or something. It's literally just them lounging, <laughs> and then it was the end of it. So this time, Clara, Kate, and I stopped to do some business by telephone. Guess we're going to be here for a minute. Looks like they have a few calls to make. Yeah, seems to be the only, uh, phone around for forever, <laughs> probably. What are you going to do? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> Just thought I'd stretch my legs, you know, on firm ground. I didn't realize this place would be floating on barrels. Back when I was driving long hauls, that's the real big trucks now, I sometimes wouldn't leave the cab but to pump gas. I took my meals in there, I slept in there, I changed my socks in there, you know, the whole thing. So one time I was hauling a bunch of big spools, telephone wire I think actually, up from California into Washington State. You know where that is? It's way out, uh, on the map it's kind of to the left of here, more or less. In between California and Washington, there's a place called Oregon, and you can't pump your own gas there. They have a guy who does it called a gas jockey, and you'd better not even open your door or they get all suspicious. I drove through California and into Washington, and I refueled in the middle in Oregon. And so I didn't set foot out of my truck for a whole day. When I came out of that cab, the ground rushed up like it missed me. Gave me a big old kiss right on the chin right there. What I'm saying is, hell, I forget. <laughs> what am I talking about? Uh, it's important to take breaks. Exactly. Don't forget that. And don't say I never taught you anything. Well, guess I'll head back aboard. Let's see if I can find any of the good stuff stashed in the... 
Maybe in the spice cabinet? Maybe in the medicine cabinet? <laughs> That's where it belongs. Hell, who am I talking to? Don't listen to me, kid. I'll see you in a few. Uh... Goodbye, Conway. <laughs> you have 23 new messages. This... Why... Okay, I have two observations here. One... This is the Bureau of Reclaimed Spaces, and that is a bear hanging out and sniffing around. Secondly, why is Will calling it to the Bureau of Reclaimed Spaces? Checking for messages there. I don't understand. Do they work there? Did they work there? What? Yeah. 
about to cross the ocean. I worry about my dog. I'm about to cross an ocean and I worry about my dog. Remember that person we encountered before who was uh, boating across the water, just them and their dog, and I think the dog had to swim? Could that be them? What did we just listen to? That was bizarre on so many levels, and I'm fascinated. Okay, first, I think, as far as I can remember, that is the only time in the entire game we've heard people speak. Like, actual intelligible language, other than through songs. We've never actually heard anybody's voice just talking before. And now we just heard a bunch of people talking. That immediately stood out as just bizarre. Voice acting? That was really surprising and caught me off guard. Secondly, again, why is Will calling into the Bureau of Reclaimed Spaces? How? Wh huh? How are they connected? I guess the third major odd thing is, what did we just listen to? <laughs> it sounded like all these people were calling in to respond to, like, some sort of a prompt, but it didn't seem like they were all responding to the same prompt. Some people seem to be answering the question of like, what's the first thing you remember? You know, the first the first thing you ever remember. 
Um, some people seem to be responding to the question of like, uh, why are you having trouble sleeping or something like that? Or like, why are you still awake? And other people, I don't even know, just seemingly random memories. That was so bizarre. I love it. Shannon to Ezra. Don't you go diving in too. It's actually really cold and kind of dangerous. Did he say where he was going? He's looking for the good stuff. They're not about to jump off too, are they? <laughs> They're looking at the edge. They're eyeing it. I see. Still thirsty. Kate keeps some diet soda in the broom closet. But you didn't hear it from me. It's next to the bleach. Bring a flashlight. Oh. No, I don't think that's what he's looking for. So, any important messages? Every single one. So, I wonder if that's an extension of the show that Will doesn't remember doing, or at least said they didn't remember doing. Because it sounded like they were in a position of basically just listening. Just listening to people talk. And that's, I guess, what Will was doing there on the phone. Huh. To Ezra, where are you headed tonight, small man? Just following my friends. Is this young woman your friend? We met Ezra earlier tonight. He's been very helpful. Hoping we can return the favor once we get back above ground. Poor kid was sleeping at the bus station. I just lost track of his folks. He'll be alright. He's more at home down here than any of us. Trust me, I have an eye for it. Summer. Kate, thanks for calling. Oh my god, please tell me they're a couple. I mean, I guess it would sort of crush, probably crush my dreams of Shannon and uh, Kate getting together, but... <gasps> couple? How are you feeling? Oh, whoops, I selected the wrong option. Hope I didn't wake you up. No, I can't really get comfortable enough to sleep anymore. Except in the car. Oh, not driving. In the passenger seat. Reclined. Eric drove me around the reservoir this afternoon, and I got an hour or two in. I couldn't get settled in bed, so I was just watching TV. Some cooking show about high-concept junk food, and everyone from my high school chemistry class was there, making cupcakes out of old bicycle parts. I think I might have dozed off a bit, actually. Honestly, this baby can come out whenever he wants. I'm completely over it. Don't rush it. Just try to get some rest. That's what Eric says. Guess it'll happen when it happens. I mean, obviously it... The phone line makes a horrible sound. Whoa. God, the phone's down here is such a mess. Hey, Kate. I really appreciate you checking in. I have your pager number, and so does Eric. Just in case I'm too, uh, distracted or whatever. I'll let you go. I should try to eat something. Hmm. Rishi will help with your joint pain. Okay, thanks. Maybe I'll just chew on some ice. Talk to you soon, Kate. Hopefully. Nah, I don't think they're together. Dang it. Just checking in on a client. Did I mention I'm a birth doula? Oh, right! Oh, that makes sense. I totally forgot. Ah. 
How does that fit with being a tugboat captain? Some women choose to come labor on the boat, actually. For the rest, I have a backup, just in case I can't get back to dry land in time. I've been lucky, and only had to lean on her a handful of times, out of several hundred births. You'd never believe how many people are just born all the time. Everything okay? Everything's great. Sounds like she's ready. Some women just know. It's amazing. Others are caught totally by surprise. Your friend went back aboard? Don't worry. He doesn't know about your soda stash. You were sworn to secrecy. <laughs> it's okay. I got rid of all that junk food anyway. I'm on a star thistle and grapefruit cleanse. Is this Clara? Was it Clara? The musician? Nadia. I'm glad you phoned. I was just thinking of you. Yeah, it is Clara. Sorry I didn't call this week. I've been traveling constantly. That's fine. I visited the hospital yesterday. I went to visit Uncle Andreas, but they moved him. Now he's in a hospice care facility run by some old Polish nun. Everyone says it's very... nice. I asked them about visiting and they said he didn't want any visitors. He's just being stubborn. Yes, it's typical of Andreas. I was thinking, maybe if you came to visit, he would see you. All those afternoons you two would go drinking beers by the river. Don't you think it would mean a lot to him if he could say goodbye to you in person? Oh, Nadia. I would never make it back in time anyway. That's true. You're a long way from home, Clara. I suppose it can't be helped. Oh, here's Mother at the door. We're going to try again to see him. Hope the tour is going well. Love you. Be careful. My sister back home. She's very depressing to me this morning. My Uncle Andreas is terminally ill and refusing visitors, and Nadia is making a stir about it. Sorry to hear. Are you close? Yes, but only recently. He lived abroad for most of my life. I only met him a few years ago. My sister is older, so she knew him as a child, too. So I think her respect for him is distorted by sentiment. We must always take the dying at their word. Their motivations are beyond our understanding. The older man. He's swimming back to the mammoth. No emergency, I hope. Seems he has a sweet tooth. <laughs> I know the type. Andrea's always carried peppermints. Brandon approaches. Don't suppose any of you folks are headed past the Bureau of Reclaimed Spaces? Uh, not on this run, but we'll be coming back this way in a few hours. Well, I may still be here then. It's no big deal. I'll just hang out and read or something until it's time to head back to work. Hey, you folks are traveling with that old guy, right? With the leg? Is he okay? Saw him earlier tonight. He came by the storage facility for some files. He totally bit it on the staircase. Oh! Oh, that's who that is. That's the person that was just... I guess as a hobby, although what they did went beyond a hobby, but not quite to the point of an official job because they weren't being paid to do it. They were the one that was maintaining the, uh, the, well, storage facility. He's okay though, right? Sure. He's just been drinking a bit. You know how it is. 
Yeah, you'd have to be, to dive into the echo like that. <laughs> well, have a good night. Or, uh, morning. Almost. I love this game. It's so damn good. I mean, who else could have a strange encounter with a floating telephone booth in an underground river? Everyone taking turns on it. And have that be just, like, utterly mesmerizing and fascinating. We learned so much from that about these people. I'm really glad I'm replaying this. You really do learn a lot more about what's been going on with these people. Alright, well, I think that's a pretty good place to end this episode. So I hope you've enjoyed so far, and I'll be back soon.